Why, despite all the words of wisdom from great minds through the ages about the value of change, from Herculitus to Einstein, why so often do we go out of our way to protect the status quo? Even when it's holding us back. I uh, just recently, I was a, with a friend in Somerset who's a dairy farmer, and we were talking about my job. He was asking me, what's it all about? And I said, you know, farming should use more digitalization. And he said, oh, one of my friends down the road did that, and he's just got this machine sitting in the back of his parlor, and he never uses it. So I'm not sure I see it's worthwhile. So where do people like him? Why do we, many of us, do our utmost? to avoid change. Well, if you talk to a psychologist, they will tell you that fear of change is actually evolutionary. We are programmed to fear new things because that keeps us safe. It helps us survive. In the days before public health warnings and activity apps on our smartphones, it was what stopped us falling prey to predators in unfamiliar territories. It was what stopped us eating foods we didn't recognize that could actually poison us. But whilst avoidance of the new might offer some protection from risk at an individual level, if we carry that forward into the business environment, clinging to old ways can actually expose us to greater threats make us more vulnerable to risks, some of them existential. It actually makes us less likely to evolve in step with the changing aspirations of our customers, maybe less likely to keep pace with our competitors, maybe less resilient in the face of changes in our business environment, maybe less likely to tackle problems in our existing operations. And that's why it's so important that businesses are able to find their way to organisations like Innovate UK, Made Smarter or the Manufacturing Catapult that can help them overcome their fears and manage their uncertainties. Organisations and people who give them access to the know-how and tools they need to develop new ideas and manage any risks as they take their steps into their futures. People who can hold their hands and give them the confidence to feel the fear and do it anyway. And where companies do reach out for support, the results can be astonishing. Let me give you just a few examples from the work our fantastic centres have done with some long established UK companies. Let's start down the road in Walsall, where you'll find vehicle hardware supplier Albert Jagger. Founded in 1887, in recent times that company had followed the trend and outsourced some of its production to China. But with increasing disruption on the global stage, the company realised that returning productive capacity to the UK would be crucial to its future. Approaching our experts for help, they sought to secure their supply chain and save their UK facilities from closure by reshoring the manufacture of one of their signature industrial hardware product ranges. Using friendly visualization tools and their world leading expertise in manufacturing optimization, our team at the MTC showed Albert Jagger just what it was possible to achieve by live mapping the shop floor in a risk free way before the company needed to make any significant capital investment. Then with the most efficient plan in place, the company was able to save and transform its block switch engineering facility, expanding their workforce. Today, Albert Jagger can make their product range in-house for half the price of the outsourced operation in China. Profit, profits went up 60% and customer satisfaction up 600%. Really, 600%. The company's openness to change allowed it to embrace a new vision and the catapult centre they worked with showed them how to realise it, how it could move to a different future. 
or let's go elsewhere down the road to Stratford-upon-Avon to meet the team from Pashley Cycles, England's longest established bicycle manufacturer. Although it's a traditional brand, Pashley realised that to continue to grow and develop, they needed to do things differently to innovate. They approached our WMG team at Warwick for help diversifying their business and preparing to seize a big new opportunity, the sort of thing Pashley had never done before. They were bidding for a contract to supply the new Transport for London cycle hire scheme. To prove they were the right partner for a bid, WMG's expert helped Pashley with the rapid prototyping of a new bicycle design, demonstrating how metal and plastic moulded parts could be used in place of traditional materials. As well as enabling Pashley to prove the new design's robustness, WMG also leveraged its extensive network of UK manufacturers to anchor the supply chain for the plastic components firmly in the UK. Completed in just two weeks, the project helped Pashley succeed in securing a five-year contract to supply the next generation of London cycle hire bicycles and led Pashley to invest in developing their own hire bike capability. Next stop, the world. Or you could head north to Sheffield, where we find footprint tools. A 150-year-old business that's been in the Jewett family for four generations. The firm had enjoyed huge success during the heyday of coal and steel. But the low-wage economies in the Far East, the collapse of coal and steel, and the 2008 financial crash brought the company to the brink of closure. Now... Did it hunker down? Did it stick to its usual way of doing things and hope for the best? Thank goodness, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it did not. What the company did was turn to the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, the AMRC, in Rotherham, on the outskirts of Sheffield. The AMRC team worked with Footprint to develop a robot cell, producing the company's staple product, the Humble Builder's Line Pin. Freeing up two skilled workers for other tasks, the company now fulfills orders three times faster than before, keeping prices competitive and customers happy. So there's just three examples, but in each of these cases, doing things differently, embracing change, harnessing the power of new technologies, particularly digital, was at the heart of transforming the prospects for these businesses. The leaders of these businesses recognise we need to change and alter faith risk and death. But to cite one of my favourite quotes from that little known business guru, Jimi Hendrix, in order to change the world, you have to get your head together first. What Pashley, Jewett and Footprint had clearly done was to get their heads together. They saw the change happening around them, in their markets, in their supply chains, in their workforce. They recognised that they needed to change too. They understood that making a success of that change demanded tools and insights they didn't have. And crucially, they didn't allow themselves to be paralysed by fear. They got their heads together and they reached out to someone who could help. To an organisation that could strip away the risks of innovating and making sure that in each case, the company saw a brilliant return on the investment they were, uh, they were making. I think there's much we can all learn from the example of Pashley, Jewett and Footprint. Daring to imagine doing things differently, being open to change, can transform the outlook. Harnessing new technologies can help you cut down waste, drive up productivity, connect with customers better and serve them brilliantly. It can cut your costs and boost your income. For me, it's the very best, best path to growth. Footprint, Jewett and Pashley show the difference it can make at a company level. 
But it's also true when we think about the changes we need to make in our wider economy. At the start of this century, the regular refrain you might have heard on the street was that Britain didn't make anything anymore. People had given up on manufacturing. How wrong they were. The truth was that Britain remains one of the top 10 manufacturing countries in the world. Our manufacturers are responsible for around 10% of our GDP. They employ 2.5 million people at average wage levels, significantly above the average for the whole economy. They are typically responsible for more than half of all our exports and for nearly two-thirds of all business investment in research and development. And because of the way manufacturing is dispersed right across the country, our manufacturing sector has the power to drive the economic transformation that we want to see in communities up and down the land. Through the pandemic and with the invasion of Ukraine, I think that more and more people, including those inside the government, as we heard from the Minister Nusrat Ghani earlier, have woken up to the reality that without a sovereign manufacturing capability here within the UK, we are a less resilient, more vulnerable nation. We need our manufacturers, not just to make sure we can always get hold of the tools we need to keep us healthy, but to help us tackle some of the hugely complex, what we call wicked problems that we face as a nation, indeed as a planet, like climate change. The title of my remarks today is Innovation as the Key to Business Transformation and Growth. It could just as easily have been manufacturing innovation as the key to UK transformation and growth. Manufacturing has the power to take our whole nation into a different, a better future. It has the power to help us make the transition to cleaner, greener and totally secure energy supplies. It has the power to help us strip carbon emissions from every mode of transport, land, sea and air. It has the power to transform the prosperity of communities up and down the land, revolutionising the outlook for the people who live within them. It has the power to make the UK a technology superpower, capturing markets, bringing in investment and export revenue. It has the power if, and it's a big if, if our manufacturers seize the opportunities for change created by new technologies. Today, I believe that with the High Value Manufacturing Catapult's industrial foresight and by working with our partners and the right support from government, our manufacturers have the power to do just that. Together, they can double the value their sector generates. They can grow the number of people they employ in the high quality jobs that pay those above average wages, that boost the prosperity of the places where their employees live. They can tempt more high value inward investment into the UK and be part of transforming more of those places left behind by industrial change. And I am convinced they can do all of this whilst driving down carbon emissions from this sector and delivering the low carbon goods processes and technologies needed in every other. The High Value Manufacturing Catapult reaches out into every corner of the manufacturing world, whether you're in the process industries, food and drink, aerospace, automotive, energy, whatever, we can help you. Our seven centres in a multitude of sites right across the UK are helping every size of business from the likes of Rolls-Royce, BA Systems and Airbus to similar firms deep in the supply chain. Alongside our kit and expertise, we give them the confidence they need to get going, to innovate, to transform. I joined the Catapult almost exactly two years ago. I remain in total awe of our capabilities and just what we can achieve. I know that innovation can feel risky but I'm immensely proud to be part of an organisation that can help the companies that will make our future succeed. That it can help them tackle some of the daily challenges they face and strip away some of the risks of preparing for an uncertain future. That connect them with the right tools, the right know-how. 
that can even help them make sure they have a workforce ready to cope with new technologies and new processes that helps them to feel the fear of change and do it anyway. I've often said, but it's worth repeating, Every business here today understands that real risk, the real risk is inaction. Every business here knows that if they turn their backs on change, they will suffer the consequences, higher costs, gaps in recruitment, harder to find investment, reduced demand. Every business knows that if they fail to evolve product lines that fit with global emissions, whether that's about lower carbon emissions or waste or simply the latest design fad, they will miss opportunities and the market will move away from them. They will lose custom. In 20 years time, when we look at the world around us and when we reflect on the companies that have succeeded and grown, we won't be thinking about the firms that close their eyes to the ways this world is changing. We will celebrate those that seized the agenda, transformed the things they made and the way they make them. The sectors and subsectors that take a global lead will be those that embrace change. I know that inflationary pressures make the decision to invest today seem even harder. But even in these difficult times, I firmly believe that investing in innovation now, whether you're in business or in government, will deliver long-term rewards for every company and in turn for the whole of our nation. I'm hugely excited to see some of the developments we are helping our manufacturing sector to deliver. Engine systems and alternative fuels that cut the carbon emissions of our transport, technologies that keep the lights on without fouling our atmosphere, off-site construction methods to build the new homes, schools and hospitals we desperately need, alternatives to plastics that help tackle the scourge of plastic waste, products and processes that reduce our environmental impacts across the board, getting hold of those all-important critical minerals, and I'm honoured to say that the Minister Nuzgani, who spoke earlier, has asked me to chair an industrial task and finish group on critical minerals, which is just getting going. Those developments that innovation will not only deliver a better world for all of us, it will keep the UK manufacturers at the forefront of global markets. It will give us a more resilient economy. That's why I, we at the Catapult celebrate change. We all should. Now is the time to deal with those phobias I talked about earlier. Now is the time to embrace innovation. It's the best route, route to growth. And I will tell that to my dairy farmer friend in Somerset. And should you need someone to help you along the way, let the high value manufacturing catapult be your guide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Ed, fascinating as always. And I mean, I could sit here for an hour talking to you about innovation because you've got so much experience in this area and there's so many different uh, different things, but we don't have an hour, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I, what I will do is we will open it out as we, as we did earlier to the audience to see if you have any questions. We do have quite a short time, so please do get your questions in as soon as you can. But let me, let me start off by asking you, I guess the thing that everyone's talking about at the moment is AI. And when you look at things like AI, when you look at things like automation, how big a role do you think they're going to play in innovation and in high value manufacturing? Well, when we talk about, this is why we wanted to talk about fear, because I think AI is something that people are wary of. And I know there's some experts in the room actually who could probably help with commenting on this as well. And this is one of the things that we endeavor across our seven centers to keep abreast of, really try and be ahead of the curve. And this is, one of the other things that we do is work very closely with the universities on that. And absolutely, we ha we're an island, aren't we? But we have to keep an external view of the world and learn what other companies are doing. And I think there's many parts of AI that we can embrace. Um, are there any questions? Does anyone have anything that they want to, to ask? Just put your hand up, we'll get the roving, roving mic. As I say, otherwise I've got loads of questions, you have to listen to me. No. Okay, let me ask you then about what you think is going to happen in the future in terms of 
international comparisons. I mean, you've worked all over the, the world. Where is the UK at the moment? And where do you think we're, we're, we're going? Where, where's the direction of travel? Well, thank you for asking me that, Brian, because it's one of my hobby horses that we need to talk up what we do here. Um, when I did work, you know, I worked in the US, I worked in France. Um, they, you know, they often talk with a lot of interest and maybe envy about some of the technologies we have over here. The most important thing is to keep that collaboration going. Um, and, you know, when I was at Airbus, it was regularly my role to champion the UK expertise. And, and actually, uh, you can't make a plane without working across nations. And I do see that very much in my role now in terms of the work we do, not only across the different centres, but also across some of the other partners we have in the UK in the innovation ecosystem. This is why shows like this are fantastic. 400 stands here. Go and network, go and meet people. And I'm delighted that there are people from overseas here as well. Because we can't have all that expertise just in one place. But at the same time, I think we do need to remind ourselves that we are actually still in that top 10 of manufacturing. And we have ambitions to go up in that league table as well. It can be difficult to innovate, though, can't it? It can be difficult within larger businesses because of perhaps the culture and maybe not do anything too radically different. But also, if you're an SME and... 90% of your business is in this industry, you don't want to do anything because you're kind of quite busy doing stuff the, the day to day. How do you find that kind of time? How do you find the space, both in large and small businesses, to innovate? So over the 11 years since the catapult was set up, we've, we've uh, obviously regularly pulled together our impact and 50% of the companies we've worked with is SMEs. And you're absolutely right, Brian. Sometimes the companies are deep immersed in what they're doing. They're fighting to keep the bottom line to employ people. And sometimes R&D is not always high on their priority list. And during COVID, there was certainly a lot of impact there. But one of the, one of the expertise areas that one of our centres in particular has really worked on superbly in our, is our Nuclear um, Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in Sheffield. They run a program called Fit for Nuclear, which is to do exactly as you said. Sometimes suppliers don't know how to move into a different sector. So this Fit for Nuclear program helps them learn about the requirements and needs of the nuclear sector. And actually, it's obviously working well because this has now been emulated. And there's Fit for Offshore Wind, Fit for Carbon Catcher. So it's, it's, it's developing. And I think that's exactly the kind of thing that our centres can help companies on. Do you think there's a need for businesses to kind of almost lean into the uncertainty? Because we've seen with nuclear, that's an industry that sort of slightly stopped start over the last 20 years. The small modules potentially revolutionising because they're much easier, much cheaper to, to build. Do you think that companies just need to get used to the fact that there will be slight uncertainties from time to time and they still have to kind of invest to get through that? But also, I, I think there's a certain amount of truth in that, but there's also, they probably don't recognise that they're sitting on a gold mine in terms of their capabilities. They, we, we want to help educate them and help them learn about some of the expertise they have can be turned into a use in other sectors. And this is really important role that the Catapult plays in terms of foresighting for future technologies. So the big project we're working on, and I'm sure a number of people here are working on in terms of hydrogen, so there's a bit of fear around that. Um, and uh, one of our centres, the National Composite Centre in Bristol, has recently launched a new training scheme all about hydrogen. So some of it is about the education role that our centres can provide. I think if we were sitting here sort of 15 years ago, we'd have been saying, oh, uh, is business joined up with universities? You know, we know a lot of research is going on at universities. Is it often industrialised? That does seem to have changed and improved in recent years. Is, is that right? Is that, has that changed? So the catapults, uh, we have a line we use that we're the bridge between business and academia. So some of our centres, the seven centres, are partnered with universities. So Sheffield, for example, Warwick and Bristol. Um, and Strathclyde, we have a centre up in, um, in, in Strathclyde. Good. Glad to hear it. Strathclyde. Um, and the, the advantage there is that we can have a lot of, you know, people, not only people, talent who move for within a university department into our centres, but also they can make sure they keep ahead of the curve in terms of academic study. But the academics love it too, because they can come and speak to some of the businesses that we work with in our centres to actually have some real-time testing, some examples of techniques, so the university sector is incredibly strong in the UK. And it's not just the partners that we have in our catapult. We work with a number of other organisations. I see the Institute for Manufacturing have a stand here as well, part of Cambridge University. 
So they are fantastic on the theory and we work with them very closely. Um, and again, but this is also where we can collaborate. So let's hope we get Horizon Europe sorted out soon because I remember when I arrived, a lot of my new colleagues told me how important it was to work on joint European projects. So uh, let's, and part of my job is to make sure the government hear about the importance of that kind of working together as well. And uh, now time for a shameless plug. We do have the Institute for Manufacturing speaking tomorrow. So if you're around tomorrow morning at the, at the conference, do come along and, and hear from that. A lot of interesting research going on there. Just coming back to whether there are any questions that anyone else wants to, wants to ask or if there are any, put your hand up. If not, I'm going to come on to net zero because this is essentially an area that cuts across all industries, all sectors, all businesses. Everyone is going to have to get ready for it. What's the role of the catapult in terms of, you know, making the country and making businesses ready for, for net zero? So you may remember I talked about our wicked problems. So we have, we're looking at these four key strategic imperatives and net zero is absolutely one of those. Um, and many people say, gosh, you're being terribly ambitious. You set yourself some very strong targets. How can you possibly deliver those? It's the businesses that have to um, really deliver those. But one of the things we're endeavoring to do, not only is our convening and collaboration power, but we're also working closely with various institutes such as the BSI on standards, setting standards for measuring the impact of reducing your emissions. Of course, the work being done on sustainable materials is part of that. We're working very closely with our sister catapult, the offshore renewable energy catapult on wind turbines. Can we help encourage them to become even more recyclable? Um, and that's part of sort of reducing consumption um, and, you know, we do have high targets um, and it's all, all about energy reduction as well, which I was at a meeting yesterday with the government when a number of large manufacturers were saying, you know, how hard they've been hit by energy prices. And that's across the board. Um, but obviously one of the other things we can do in terms of some of our digitalization techniques is help collect data. So if you go to our fantastic centre in Sheffield, Factory of the Future, Factory 2050, you will see this incredible um, uh, charts on the wall or on the video screen of which absolutely measure every single sort of gigawatt of power that's used by that factory and it's incredible even when somebody turns on a kettle you can see and so all of that kind of data gathering it's a whole um, air, again another gold mine as um, if you get that data then you can help look at exactly the impact of your company. And I suppose in some ways you know in a world of uncertainty as we've had over the last 15 years you know, the net zero thing is not going to go away. That is a certain thing that everyone's going to have to work towards, isn't it? I mean, I'm happy to champion it. Um, I, know I used to work long ago in the automotive sector. And then when I moved to work in aerospace, somebody said to me, out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> um, but actually, um, I used to say my uh, former Airbus colleagues, certainly the wind and the, w the wing experts, the designers there, they spent every day trying to make more carbon neutral mm. aircraft. And I think maybe, it's, you know, the, the engineers of the future are the ones that are going to help with the production on net zero. So where do you think the barriers to innovation are and what are the kind of best ways to approach breaking those down? I think there's one aspect which is ensuring government support remains. So as you said earlier, I think the minister said earlier, um, investment in the catapults has been important as part of that. Innovate UK, go and talk to them. They have various offerings in terms of innovation support. Um, and also regionally, so many, many areas around the UK, here in Birmingham, you've got a strong innovation quarter. There's many areas of support you can go to, but it's not just funding. It's also, you know, learning about where to go to get advice. And, and actually, I heard the other day from one of our CEOs of one of our centres said that businesses come to them and they know they need help, but they don't actually know what they need. So sometimes one of the first things they have to do is a bit like going to the doctor is sitting down and working out what it actually is their problems. So that's, that's one aspect. But innovation can touch all parts of the economy. And, you know, we need to ensure it's seen and, and prized and seen as something of a privilege that we have in the UK that can be built on. You talked about data and data is incredibly important and it's becoming easier and easier to generate. How do businesses go about making sure that the data they're capturing is useful data that's productive that they can do something with rather than just a whole series of numbers that end up quite overwhelming? Yeah, that's the whole point. So I mean, you'll probably hear from some of my other colleagues. I know they're speaking at some of the other theatres around here. Um, you know, people don't realise what they're sitting on in terms of the information now. It's not just financial 
figures. It's also, again, as I mentioned, energy. Um, again, one of our, you know, our team of engineers working in Sheffield, if you just tweak something on a machine, you can re and, you, and then you can measure the tweak that you've done. It makes an incredible difference to the performance of that machine. And you can only sometimes do that by data management. And kind of linked to that, I guess, is also productivity. And we know that the UK has struggled a lot with productivity, is behind a lot of our, our European countries. Do you think the clusters are in a good place in terms of trying to, to raise that productivity? Or is that something that you see as your, part of your, your responsibility and role? So I'm not an, en an economist either, but um, I think there's a big debate about how productivity is managed. And uh, there's probably another another reason to have another speech for somebody but I think there's a big debate about that but the clustering work I mean it's not necessarily a new thing but I know the government is part of the leveling up white paper it was very much part of their strategy um, and you know here in the West Midlands obviously huge strength in in automation um, and yeah fantastic businesses that were here and they need to continue to develop I was up in Greater Manchester recently and um, obviously heard a lot and Jürgen who was speaking here earlier, obviously done a lot on sustainable materials and developments there. So clustering is absolutely a real thing. There is a bit of a danger that every region claims they're the experts in cyber or on hydrogen. Mm. But at the same, t same time, that's good. There's healthy competition. Our role in the catapults is um, help that competition to a certain extent, but also maybe advise when an area perhaps isn't as expert as they thought they were, but then introducing them to partners who are. One of the things we just said from the business I spoke to just before on this uh, on this stage was they had gone in for diversification in quite a in quite a major way, and one of the big things for them was freedom to fail. You know, people have to be able to believe that they can suggest something and it goes wrong and you can fix it and it's fine. How important do you think that is in terms of innovation? Yeah, I mean, this is why the the sort of theme of my speech this feel the fear. Um, it's it, you know you. I understand, you know, there's a very different culture sometimes in the US where it's okay to fail. Um, now, you know, I, I appreciate when you're running a school business and you're employing people, you've got a tough um, economy ahead of you with other costs hitting you. It's, it's nervous to make that step. But I think the whole point is you need to make that step. You need to be encouraged and you need to maybe learn from other people who have made similar steps. So all I would say is come and ask us. We can help you with that. So just my final question from from me. There's been a lot of change going on. We've seen Brexit, we've seen the pandemic, we've you know obviously gone through Ukraine, the impact on energy prices, cost of living crisis. How confident are you in the future of UK business, UK industry? Yeah, I mean, I think the other challenge I would add to your list is um, the skills shortages. So um, that's again something when the catapults were first set up, we weren't initially dedicated to doing training and skills, but actually it's an area we're really developing and it's part of the work we're doing on foresighting of technology. So I think that's another area to, to tackle. But, you know, let's remember other nations also have these challenges. Um, and, you know, it's important the manufacturing sector makes its voice known to governments. And I'm happy to do what I can on that endeavour. But um, there are some strong voices, but I do feel our sector needs to shout a bit louder. Catherine Bennett, thank you very much.